And welcome to Bench Monster TV. I am the Bench Monster with my co-host Ashley Lynn Condre. And how's everybody doing this evening? Thanks All for righty showing then. Up. Thanks for joining us. We're happy to be here today. Good hope to see everybody. Hope everybody's week went well and your training did also in your garage gym or your private gym, wherever you may be working out. God bless you. We've had a pretty good week, doing the best we can training and getting some work in. So I've had a, not a very good week. My bench wasn't yeah, very well on Tuesday. Max effort bench didn't go too well for me, so I'm not going to speak upon it. <laughs> so I'm embarrassed and I'm not going to say nothing. So like, maybe... once things get more back to normal, we'll spend like the first part of our episodes, most of them going through like some of the um, more exciting performances in powerlifting and, you know, what's going on with some of our favorite lifters and stuff. Right now, there's obviously not much for, to report because no meets are going on, but um, once things start opening back up, we definitely want to like, kind of spend some time talking about what's going on in powerlifting currently. I found out I want to do, I do want to say something. I did get a post today from my friend Nathan Brandenhorst, who's in the chat room. Nice to see you, sir. That Julius Maddox is going for 800 oh, nice. bench in June. Now, that's exciting. I wish I could be there for that. That's a part of history that you'll probably never see again. And I would definitely like to be there for that. I mean, his 770 was phenomenal. But next week's episode, we're going to cover the Arnold Classic, um, our views. She actually lifted out there. I don't know. Many people don't know that at the XPC contest. And uh, we're going to go over who we met, what we did, how fun it was. And Some stories. And yeah. we went to West Side. So talk about that a little bit. We'll talk about that. And... and um, um, but like I said, normally we would start off by talking about powerlifting news, and, and if our, our training is uh, anything worth talking about, we talk about that too. But uh, first off, I, I like to talk about some questions here. We got a lot of questions See, this past la week. Last time we, um, we tried to enable the chat, um, and it wasn't working, and we couldn't figure out why we weren't able to get questions and comments. Um, but after the fact, we realized we had set it for children, for like the ch child setting which disables the chat, the live chat. So that was why it wasn't working. We've got it working today. Um, so we have some questions that people kind of gave us last time right. that we're going to um, use today's episode to answer. So that's kind of what we're going to spend most of today talking about. Cody Plum, what's up, man? Uh, John Smith, we are going to cover that. You are in the questionnaire here, and that's going to be a fun story to tell about Mendelssohn. <laughs> I can't wait. First off, we're going to start with Ashley. She got a bunch of questions from her Facebook page and her messenger, yeah. messenger and instagram so we'll jump onto those real quick and um, we'll just start off by saying her this first name of this person is mary and she wants to know how did you get into powerlifting how i got into powerlifting she's well, a three lift lifter unlike me <laughs> so um so i got into powerlifting right after high school um i stayed in town going to cbc here locally um and i got myself into a little bit of trouble i um, not huge trouble but enough that my parents felt that I had too much time on my hands because um, I wasn't playing, you know, I wasn't doing softball and gymnastics anymore. Um, so I was just, I had too much time to get in trouble. So my dad said, you are either going to join a gym or get a job. And I was like, well, gym sounds like a fun idea. I'll get in shape. Um, so I did that and I joined, uh, what was it at the time? Life Quest. Life Quest, which is where you were at. And uh, so I met you. And started bench pressing and did some bench press only meets for a while, uh, which was stupid. <laughs> it's silly to look back on that because now that's my least favorite lift. But um, so we did some bench only meets and uh, I decided to try full power and fell in love with it. <laughs> and that's what I've done ever since. And so that's how I got into, that's how I got into powerlifting. And how long have you been powerlifting now? <sighs> Gosh, like... 12 years. 12 years, wow. Something like that since 2008. Well, hopefully uh, one day... The year I joined the gym, I think, was either 2007, 2008. I was like 19. Yeah, well, hopefully and one day... Later you, that year I met you. Or... You put on some gear and, and, and go into the gear world. Spot one of these suits. days. Yeah. yeah, one of these days I might. Okay. Well, on here's... my 40th birthday, I think I'm going to get all all uh, gear and go start going equip, maybe. Here's a question I don't have an answer for. Jenny wants to know, what are your favorite assistant exercises for the deadlift? Ooh. Oh, I've got a lot. Um, I'll narrow it down to only yeah. four or five. Um, I love good mornings. Um, after, you know, every time I deadlift, I like to, almost every every time, um, I like to pick a variation of good morning and work up to, hev on, on heavy day, I work up to uh, heavy five, five for five. On lighter days, I go five, five for eight. Um, great for building back strength. Um, uh, deficit pulls. That's the other one I love. When I first, first started deadlifting, 
I lived on those. Um, great for building off the floor power. Um, you know, once you take the plates away, it feels like you're doing like a partial movement. You know, it just feels like such a shorter range of motion. Mm. So I love standing on a plate and getting some deadlifts in. Um, good mornings, deficit pulls. Um, I love deadlifting with chains because um, that addresses one of my biggest weaknesses, which is the lockout. Um, so when you bench, or excuse me, <laughs> bench, wow. <laughs> when you deadlift with chain, it um, it makes it so as you're pulling the bar off the floor, it's actually getting heavier and heavier and heavier towards the lockout. So like as it's getting heavy and you're like, oh my gosh, am I going to be able to finish it? You know, oh crap, it's getting heavier. So I've actually got to pull heavier. You know, I got to pull harder. Yeah, you have no choice. Um, so then once you start taking the chains off, it starts to feel a lot better at the top. So I love those. Um, and... Uh, Plate pulls, like putting them up on like either a plate or like a small box, like a like an inch and a half to two inches off the ground, or depending on where your sticking point is. Um, I like I like 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 a plate plate size. We have perfect little boxes at our gym that work great, um, and just kind of overloading the bar and and working on some partial movements. Uh, I love those. I have a lot. I, I also like uh, single leg RDLs. I like stiff legged uh, deadlifts with a barbell. All sorts of stuff. They're all. Mm. I'll cut it off there okay. so we can get into your questions. These questions I copied from the last episode uh, comment section of the YouTube channel, and we wrote down names and questions, and I will answer those now. Briefly, but I will ramble, so sit back, relax. Um, so Shane, Shane Ramberg, would like ask, I, I'd love to see some tutorials on shirted benching and info on how a shirt should fit. Um, so that'll be like a separate, like a whole, we'll do a whole separate episode on a benching tutorial and shirted and stuff, but we'll let you, t you know. Yeah, how a shirt on. should fit. So basically if you're wearing, um, there's two types of shirts now. There's old school, there's new school. And new school are the Vipers and the Bench Daddies and the Krugers and more to come. So if you're an old school bench shirt, you basically want that thing painted on you. No wrinkles, no gaps, no bell bottom sleeves. You want that thing painted on you tight and everybody's body structure is somewhat different how big you are at the end of the arm middle of the arm deltoid measurements a big one where the bench shirt opening of the uh, shoulder is that's a measurement that's under the armpit over the top of the delt that's an important one you need this thing tight all the way around and when you have that shirt on you basically want to make sure that your arms aren't out here like frankenstein now with the new age shirts that's how you wear them so you put your arms out here and you actually have to load the shirt before you bench so you actually want them out here the old school shirts, basically you want them down here. Not by your side. I'm not a big fan of that. Some, I've seen some people make those work. But I like mine hanging, you know, right here. Not straight out in front, but about right here. And that usually uh, is an optimal fit for a bench shirt. Um, like I said, we'll do some videos on that too, uh, wearing bench shirts. And uh, I wear both. I wear all kinds of shirts. Have been for uh, 20, 27 years now. So I know a little bit about them. So. Um, John Smith. John Smith. Would love to hear the story of how you and Mendelssohn met up and the rivalry going forward. Well, how me and Mendelssohn met up was at the Arnold Classic 2002. My first trip out there, I was an invite. We had to, uh, Somebody pulled some strings for me and got me an invite in there. And uh, I was pleased to, nervous actually when I went there, but I uh, went to the warm-up area. And there were two benches. There was one here in front of me and way down here was another bench. And way down here in this other bench... Everybody was on it. Gary Frank, uh, the West Side guy. We're all over here. But over here, there was just this one man. And he was a big man. And he was sitting on the bench. And he had three plates on there. And uh, I was like, well, I'll just warm up with this dude. And I walked over. And I said, you mind if I get two plates? And he looked at me and said, yeah, but you better hurry. <laughs> kind of snapped at me. And I'm like, okay, wow. So Somehow I warmed up with him, and somehow the uh, boom bada bing, the meet was over, and he did 755, and I did 739, which was a six pound PR, by the way. Thank you, Louis Simmons. That was the uh, four months of uh, bands and chains, and I was just uh, uh, bettering my bench at that point. And the next day, I walked over to the WPO, which is across the hallway in the three lift area, and he was, Mendelssohn was at a booth. And I walked up to him, and I have a picture. It's at my other house. I should bring it down because it's kind of funny. But I walked up to him, and I said, I'm going to take your record. I looked him right in the eye, and he got right in my face and told me, you better train harder. Well, that was March 5th, 2002, April that year. The next month, I did a 769, and I took his bench. 
And a month later, I did a 785, tied Anthony Clark's record, according to the all-time statistician at that time, and was 785, which I, did, I thought he did 800. So two months later, 800. And then Mendelssohn came out and did 821, and that's when the battle started back and forth. But, uh, you know, if it wasn't for him, you know, at that time, he was the one pushing me. He was the one calling me up Saturday morning, out of bed, I'm eating my cereal, and the phone rings, and he says, I took your record, bro. <laughs> And I'd, be, I'd have to get on the internet, and sure enough, he's he's cracking them out. And he, Mendelssohn shot all the way up to a thousand, you know, thirty-one, and he got the lead on me there. And uh, but uh, if it wasn't for him and, and that uh, that that competitive nature that we both have, we pushed each other, and I can't thank him enough for that. Next, Next question. Axis one. Axis one. Like would like to know. Do you do any specific exercises or strategies to prevent injury? like pausing in training for a week sometimes, face pulls, or something like that? Well, to prevent injuries in training, you need to use proper technique. That's, pro that's, that's priority number one. So, I mean, you can get hurt with 135, you can get hurt with 1,035. So you need to use the proper technique at all times. And uh, when you get too heavy, um, proper technique goes out the window and you turn into gangster mode, fight or flight, and lots a lot of times when you get injured. Um, I myself have been injured um, but due to technical uh, imperfection. So um, ex as far as pausing in the bench press, I really don't train the actual pause in a bench press. I pause on every exercise that I do, whether it be floor press, board press, uh, you know, whatever exercise we're doing, decline. I mean, you, you incorporate some pauses in there. So you, you know, it's just a rule, but you still want to incorporate it in your training and, and learn to come down and, and wait for that, uh, that pause. Because if you don't, you know, and then it's like, oh, two weeks out from meet, I'm going to pause, you might have a problem. And it might destroy your ego because many people, you know, they come in and they can do a touch and go with like 300. And uh, right, right there, if you can touch and go 300, I always deduct 30, 40 pounds to, uh, to account for the pause. So you need to do that in training. But injury prevention, I don't do much stretching. I warm up. You know, I don't train the rotator cuffs. I don't, uh, you know, I'm, I'm just kind of bulletproof. And, uh, but um, mortal in the same sense because I've been injured before. Pec tears and uh, uh, what else have I done? Haven't done anything else too crazy, but, um, you know, those things happen and you move forward. I mean, it's not the end of the world, and uh, you're only down for a certain amount of time, and you will come back. So, but uh, injury prevention, uh, technique, number one. Andrew? Andrew. Would like to know, how did you modify Westside's conjugate into the system you are using today? Love to hear your story with Westside. Uh, story with Westside goes, um, I'll tell this fork in the road story at another episode, but uh, I ended up quitting powerlifting, moving to Florida as far away I can get from this, this state, and I uh, went down there, wanted to do, do something different, and actually walked away from lifting, and boom, bada bing, next thing you know, I'm lifting, and I'm like, well, I'm doing a meet, Daytona Bench for Cash, and I went up there and did that, brought my best stuff that I had, that had gotten me to 733, and it didn't work out that day. I lost to West Side. I did a 7-11, double dipped it, locked it out. It was the likeliest thing I've ever seen. And uh, I walked up to Louie that, that day, and I said, Louie, I need help. And uh, he told me to call him. I did, I did that for two days. And um, uh, basically at that point, um, I just took everything that I had done to 7:33, dumped it. All West Side training. And um, I came, came back out of that, and like I said, went to the Arnold, did a six-pound PR at the Arnold, and then uh, eventually went on to bench 800. And if it wasn't for Louis Simmons and his teachings and that fork in the road I took to Florida, to Daytona, and all that, I would not be the bench monster. I really don't know where I'd be. I'd probably still be hunting down. You know, I think everything happens for a reason, and I'm glad I took that fork on the road. It was a, it was a big fork, but um, yeah, if it wasn't for that, I, I don't think I would be where I'm at today. I'd probably... Who knows? Uh, all I know is because of that, I became, you know, the 800 bench press guy, the 900, and uh, 10,076, I guess, so. Okay. Jonathan Harder. It would be great if you could outline your training, what you were trying to work on, fix with accessories, also maybe your philosophy to your training, and how you think it will bring you to your goals. Outline my training. We'll talk about bench training only. I speed bench on uh, Friday at this point, and we max effort on Tuesday. I myself like to train speed bench on Tuesday or Wednesday, max effort on Saturday around noon, because that's when a contest would be, and that's when I would be benching at noon. So I want to do the same thing at the same time of day. That's what I did for many years, um, and that seemed to work. 
But, uh, you know, speed benching, you know, consists of uh, between 45 and 50% bar weight and 25% band tension. And uh, max effort day, I rotate uh, the floor press, the board press, the uh, decline. I mean, I, there's m multiple exercises. I have 49 or 50 tricep exercises that we rotate also. So there's never a dull moment. And uh, when we go to train, you know, and it's time to do assistance work, I make it up on the spot or I make up the assistance work as I'm driving to the gym. And uh, that's, how, that's how I incorporate it. But uh, the, in, uh, the second part of that question is my philosophy on training is what you put in is what you get out. Uh, you're 110% in or you're out. You know, I don't like half-ass people that put in 50, 60, and then, you know, that doesn't do it for me. Like, don't even show up. If you're not there to put in 110%, you know, like I said, you got to maximize these uh, five factors here, eating, sleeping, training, supplementation, and technique. Those have to be maxified, and uh, you can't half-ass on any of those. And I don't, I don't see on this finger anywhere where it says drink, party, do math, and whatever else you do in life. So you're either all in or all out. That's my philosophy on training. you got to put 110% into it. And uh, at the end of the day, when I'm old-er, like real old, and I look back and I can say, hey, I gave it my all, you know, and I, I, there wasn't any, oh, I would have, could have, should have, if I wouldn't have drank that whole summer. No, that won't be me. That may be you. You know, I hear it all the time. Oh, so-and-so squatted a thousand, and before he did it, he drank 15-pack or 12-pack or something. Yeah, you know, when that, that guy's uh, 70 years old, 80 years old, he's going to look back and say, man, I gave it my, no, he can't say you gave it at all. He gave it 90% in my book. So, you know, you're 110%, and that's my philosophy, man. So. Oh, we see uh, some ch chat questions over here. There, yeah, there yeah was, quite a few. Was, there was one Can you read them? Um, the one about West Side and the five for five. <coughs> here, I'll, I'll go. We'll just start Chris Goodwitch. Um, Pick one of them. Ryan, did you get the Bench Daddy shirt yet? I have not got the Bench Daddy shirt yet. I ordered it January hmm, 16th. But I understand, you know, it's a slow process, and some people wait a long time. And I, I told Mike Womack, you know, no rush, you know. But where, what is it now? May? So, it, I guess, yeah. Well, a guy on my team, he got his triple ply recently, and he ordered it in December. So I don't think I'm that far off from getting it. I have that Kruger shirt, and uh, I wore that recently, and I was pretty impressed. And um, so I'm looking forward to that. I'm looking forward to getting the Viper, too, from uh, John Ellick, or whatever the name of it will be. And um, I'll have a wide variety of uh, shirts to play with and uh, videos to post. So what else do you got? Um Inzer, your still go-to shirt. Inzer, John Inzer, uh, a blue phenom. You know, I still got phenoms. Um, um, I sent some to Westside because there's some lifters there that were um, in need of some shirts, and I like to, you know, I'll give the shirt off my back to help people out. And I sent four out there for uh, for for a guy, and um, I know they'll get used. I mean, it's not like I just sent them out there and they're going to use them as floor mats. I mean, they're going to put them to use, and uh, so that's why I do that. But um, no, I'll still wear that shirt. Um, but, you know, I, uh, with the Inzer shirt, I, I miss the old material, 2007, 2012 material. You know, it had a lot of elasticity in it, and it doesn't anymore. So it, I don't get what's called the carryover I once got. And that was about 450 pounds of carryover on top of my raw bench. So, you know, the, the carryover has actually dropped to uh, around 300, and that's not suffice for this kid. So that's why I'm looking for the next greatest thing that's going to give me carryover. 600 bench, you get 500 carry carry over out of your shirt, 500 pounds, that puts you at 1100. So that's the uh, that's the secret sauce to a bench shirt is getting carry over. So what Go do ahead. you think about Maddox? Julius Maddox. Was amazing. Uh, we were there. We saw his seven. Saw his well, I saw, first time in history, I saw two 700 raw benches. Thomas T D Davis blasted up 700 like a speed bench. Julius did it too, and he comes out into 770. Super nice guy, nice. Mo just yeah. down to earth, humble. Um, after he benched, I spoke with him, and uh, we talked about uh, uh, some strategy for benching. He actually gave me his phone number, told me how to call him, and um, I'm gonna take him up on that because, you know, like I said, one of the things he told me was every every bench movement that he does, he does four pulling movements for for his back. You know, so. It's like a, a one to four ratio thing. So I want to pick his brain a little bit because I want to get better. Do I do it all? Absolutely not. But, uh, you know, and uh, but he took the time to talk to me. Really nice guy, man. And just, uh, yeah, super cool. Okay, this was the one that I was. Ryan, I noticed lately at Westside, Louie has the, fir the lifters using higher reps for their dynamic days, like five for five, for example. I have been running nine sets of three or 12 sets of three for many years. What are your thoughts for speed work? Remember, we went in there, and that's what I thought we were going to do was the yeah. uh, nine triples. Or, well, it was speed. I said that we were going to do the, the speed doubles. 
right. or on squat day. No, five fives, he's, he's doing. Yeah, hey, Louis, Louis the the god, you know, and he decides what goes in that gym, and that's what they're doing. That's the phase they're going through. I myself like the nine sets of three when I'm 12 weeks out from a meet. When I'm further out from a meet, it's uh, I switch it between 12 and 15 sets of three, or we do the West Side method of six, six sets of six, eight sets of eight, ten sets of ten, and just a little bit of variety, put on some muscle mass during that time. But when a meet approaches, it's nine sets of three or eight sets of three. And um, that's what I do when I get close to a meet. But five sets of five, are they doing that on bench also? Because I know West McCormick. I'm not sure about bench. But yeah. When I, when I, I was going to do squat, I did squat and deadlift like a speed day there with them. And right. I thought that's what I was going to do. The usual, I was going to do the singles for this, you know, eight singles for deadlift. And he's like, oh, no, we're going to do five for five. Well, I was, there, right. I was there when they were squatting on Monday morning. And, of course, I'm the bench monster, so I was benching. And uh, I was doing speed reps with, uh, what, eight, nine sets of three was what I did. And no one came over and said anything to me. In fact, yeah, but no, nobody's going to say anything about well, no. even at West Side. In fact, it was kind of cool because we had breakfast with Louis Simmons and the crew. And then we go to the gym. And we walked to the gym. It was like we didn't exist. <laughs> I mean, uh, nobody. didn't. They, they yeah. said nothing to me. and They, they, they got, were training. Yeah. They were effing training. And I, I, I couldn't believe it they, until the training was over. When it was done, then everybody came. Then down. we huddled up. It was like they shut the sh- shit out, man. And um, I, I, I just overlooked and, and took it all in. It was impressive to see the the, cool. the seriousness of those guys, you know. And they're not there to, to play around. They're there to go places. And uh, it was impressive. Did you ever meet or compete with Glenn Chabot? Chabot, yeah, Glenn Chabot. I um, met him at the Arnold in 2002, and uh, he had called me a year prior to that, wanting to go head-to-head raw with me. He posted that 675 raw bench. Uh, it was on it was on powerlifting video, and uh, he called me up and was trying to get me to to blah blah blah, you know, come out and do a raw. And it, it, you know, I was kind of getting tickled about it. You know, I had a six. 20 or something or so, i don't remember what it was you know i but at that time you know i was more concerned with um uh trying to get to 800 pounds and trying to get to the arnold and um i think uh at the end there chabot uh, what did he do um he had another story with him but uh no i never got to compete with him but knew him talked to him nice guy i hope he's doing well i never he's out there somewhere um and uh wish him all the luck and uh he was supposed to make a comeback i heard but i don't know what happened with that so but that was a strong kid. I mean, he went to the Arnold that one year, and I uh, was on the Powerlifting USA with his finger up like this, was 722. And uh, I think uh, three months later, at a Wabdol meet in Springfield, Oregon, I hit a 733 and uh, surpassed him. And um, long story short, I think, you know, hitting those 700s or whatever is what, what got me into the Arnold probably the next year or whatever. I can't remember. Yeah. So, yeah. Do you know why Ken Lane left power la- powerlifting back in the day? I do not know why Ken. Ken Lane was at a meet that Inzer promoted. Uh, oh, God. This is when I had a falling out with him a long time ago. And uh, I think uh, Mendelssohn was there and met him. I don't know anything about that. I know um, he was credited with a 751 bench. And, boy, he uh, actually had his contact info. Somebody posted it on Facebook Messenger to call him. And I don't know what happened to that, but I definitely I have questions, and I would like to talk to him, and I could get those answers from him. Because he, he, he was one of the guys, you know, in 1993 when I was all of 170 body weight at 5'10", and wanting to be the greatest bench presser in my gym. You know, powerlifting USA, you open it up, and there's Ken Lane with the forearms, and there's Anthony Clark with the first grip. And these guys are 751, 777, and I'm like, it's possible. I never thought, looking at that, like, hey, I'll never be, never said that in my mind. I never said, oh, never be there. I remember, I remember exactly where I was when I'm t- telling the story. And uh, I just thought, hey, it's possible. And uh, I mean, a guy can do it reverse grip. That's awesome. And I met Anthony Clark in 1997, by the way. Really nice guy, man. Uh, we got a story about him, too. And I don't want to take up too much time. But uh, Anthony Clark, you know, I met him in September 1997. And I was able to be in the same flight as him when he benched. And he was kind enough, and there's a picture, and I don't know who has it, but uh, Anthony Clark's sitting in front of me on a chair, and he, and I said, and he says, you can put your arms up on my shoulders. And I sat behind him in my shirt. And it gives me chills just telling that story, man. And, you know, Anthony Clark, you know, when uh, uh, he would always call me at Christmas and wish me and my family Merry Christmas. He would call me. And the um, last thing he said to me was when I benched the 800, I remember he called me up, and he said, Ryan, now that you benched 800, people are going to come to you and want you to do things, want you to go places. And he goes, Ryan, you don't take anything less than $2,000. 
He told me, I'll never forget that. This was in 2002. You know, $2,000 back then was a little bit more money than it is now. And uh, that was the advice he gave me. That's the last I heard of him. And um, fortunately, he passed away, man. And he was he was this gentle giant, man, just an awesome person, an awesome character, and kind of miss him. Well, there's a question about Paul. Paul. But that's how, we'll get to that. Sorry. I'll, just, I'll, just I'll roll keep it in where I know. Yeah. I just thought. Um... Uh, let's see here. Where did I leave off at? Did you leave right here with okay. Ken Lane. Hey, yeah. Can so you Jeff talk B. about your diet? Can you talk about your diet? How many meals you eat a day and so, what do you eat? Well, that, with garage gyms right now, no gyms open. I don't eat hard and I don't really train hard because it's, we're in a cattywampa situation right now where it's going to take some time to get back to normal. Once gyms reopen, I'll uh, start eating again. But it's just uh, right now I consume 3,000 calories a day and 250 protein, I think 200 some fats, 300 carbs. It's real low, but it keeps me lean, you know, it keeps veins popping out. And that's kind of what I'm going for. And I kind of don't really need to be 350 pounds anymore that's at my old age. Be, yeah. yeah, it's not healthy. You know, you can't run around, you don't want to you get past uh, 40 years old. You really don't want to be walking around at 360. And um, at the time, you know, when I was 27, 28, 29, whatever that was. Uh, you know, I was eating 15,000 calories a day, and I thank Scott Mendelson for telling me how to eat. You know, I, uh, I met him, and he, uh, I called him up. I said, no, I, I got to gain weight. I got to eat the three, whatever. He said, oh, you need to eat four 2,500-calorie shakes a day. So at the time I was sponsored, I ordered some Champion Nutrition 2,500 calorie, mixed it with whole milk, put it in a blender, blended it up, and I turned it over, and it was a blizzard. So I had to eat it with a spoon. So I had to end up getting 1,800-calorie shakes, and I was doing four of those a day, four meals, getting up middle of the night and eating and doing 15,000. But I was 360 at the time and uh, didn't look pretty, but it can move some weight. But this day and age, you know, 3,000 calories, really shut it down, trying to stay pretty, trying to stay marketable. You know, the the, uh, the, the pudgy guy back in the day, it had its time and place, but I, I think I can do tremendous amount of weights at 308 and under. So that's what I'm shooting for. It's trying to stay healthy. I want to stay in the game. You know, don't want to end the game. Don't need to put two feet in the casket. You know what I'm saying? For sure. Yeah. Next question, please. Let's just roll. Um, Keep it moving. Can, let's see. What's your favorite slingshot slash stingray product? Jimmy, my favorite slingshot is the it's Atlas. Show. You know, I got Mark Bell's. I've got. I haven't seen a Titan. Never owned a Titan slingshot in my life. Um, but uh, John Ellick sends me toys, and whew, you know, whether it be the black and gray, the bumblebee yellow, black and yellow, or the the uh, nuclear green. You know, the green is my favorite. You know, once I got that and learned how to use it, um, that's my favorite. It's it's the most extreme, and that's what I'm looking for. I'm not looking for something single ply or half ply to do something, and I want the most I can get, and it'll hold the most weight and move the most weight. So right now it's the Atlas. Um, so this one's kind of I saw it come in right after it was kind of goes up with another question. Yeah. Do you know what ever happened to Glenn? Not going to dive into that. I've heard this story. I've heard this story. I'm not going to touch on it. Um, I don't know for factual evidence. All I know is he's not lifting, and um, that's it. I'm not going to say anything else. I, I mean, I could sit here and say, but I'm not going to. I don't know if it's true or not, and I'm not going to throw the guy under the bus. I just know he's not lifting. Okay. Fair enough. Um, hey, man, can you list some of your favorite tricep exercise or accessory, accessory variations? Uh, my favorite triceps are rolling dumbbells. Um, do those for two weeks in a row. We do them on the bench, do them on the floor, do them incline. Uh, I nickname things like winning presses, I call them, or winning extensions. Basically, you lean back on an uh, incline and you, you roll the dumbbells back, and at the top, you twist them out like this, palms facing. So that's a variation. Rolling dumbbells on the floor, I like those. Um, I like rolling dumbbells on the bench. I like decline rolling dumbbells. Those are the funnest. Um, as far as uh, the accessory work, though, I, I like a lot of close grip bench, too. Uh, Westside's incorporating a lot of that now, and, and having gone out there, they're doing a lot of uh, finger-on-smooth uh, close grip uh, benches, and um, so I'm going to start incorporating those, too. Um, um, another one of my favorites is, of course, the Spoto Press. We don't hear about Eric Spoto anymore, but um, the, fact, the way that he bench presses, coming down, pausing two inches from the chest and putting it up. I do, we do that close grip, bands, chains. I mean, always trying to add some type of resistance to the bar. Straight weight is not my friend. I like to do things that are hard and sometimes not fun. And uh, the people that I train with, they uh, a typical day would be like we do a speed bench, and they say, well, what are we going to do for triceps? And they ask me, and because uh, I'm the leader. And I say, well, what do you not want to do for triceps? And they say, oh, rolling dumbbells, they hurt me. Rolling dumbbells is what we're going to do. So, yeah, you tell me what you don't want to do, that's what we're going to do. So 
But the ticket is with rolling dumbbells. If you do them wrong, and we will have a video on this, uh, you will irritate and inflame these extensors that run over the elbow here. And once you do that and irritate them, they hurt for a long time. So uh, we recommended a lot of high band uh, push downs, um, kind of like your uh, uh, chicken flapping with its wings. You put a mini band over the top of a bar and you do a hundred of these real fast. It stimulates the soft tissue in here and actually really helps with um, the muscular soreness that occurs. Of course, ice and ibuprofen and whatever else you want to do, but you want to definitely don't want to do rolling dumbbells for more than uh, two weeks in a row. So that's how we do it. I don't know. It may not be how you do it. Yeah. What happened with you and Paul? I followed you for years. He was always with you at every meet. Then he disappeared. Paul Roch, yeah. the Rochweiler. Oh, yeah, the handoff guy, the handler, the man. Yeah, you know, we miss Paul. Um, back in the day, you know, 2010 or 11. Uh, Didn't when... he used to sign autographs? Didn't Paul <laughs> Paul was signing autographs in the Ukraine. As my handoff guy. He signed, he signed just as many autographs in the Ukraine as I did when we were over there. That's a whole other story. That's a fun story, too. There's an Mendelssohn story involved there. We'll, we'll get up on with that sometime. But, uh, no, uh, Paul actually, um, uh, I think he just uh, started working, um, hoarding that money, you know, working overtime out at the uh, Hanford Nuclear Reservation out here. And, um uh, he just worked overtime, overtime. He was stacking that money up, you know. And then he met a lady friend and uh, um, decided to buy a $500 million, 75-foot, 10,000-foot wide trailer. And I believe he's going to retire this year, and I believe he's going to travel the United States. And so you might see him at a gym near you. Who knows? Oh, it's been so long. Yeah, I haven't seen him. Seen him? Yeah. Hardly hear from him anymore. Actually, text him. Last time I saw him was at UGF. Yes, text him at Christmas. Merry Christmas, and then that's about it. So, don't see him anymore. Wish he'd come back. I know. He was so entertaining. <laughs> yeah. He didn't miss a workout. Was, he was kind of a scary lecture, but he was yeah. fun to watch. And very entertaining. Don't lose your place here. I, yeah, I did, but I'm, I'm finding yeah. it. Okay. Um, Ryan, for lat, upper back work, what are your go-to movements? Well, I train lats like a bodybuilder. I don't do the west side method where they do it at the end of speed bench. I basically have the, my own day for back. And now meeting Julius Maddox, I might have two back days. And uh, I might do all horizontal movements one day and all vertical movements. Or, you know, I don't, I don't know. But I need, I need to do more back because uh, um, an upper back, too, I do a lot of rear delt work with a, uh, with a rope, uh, face pulls, uh, laying on a bench sideways, doing dumbbells this way. I mean, you can never do enough yeah, pull aparts, so pull aparts yeah. uh, just everything. Arms, uh, I don't, right now, I don't, I'm going to tell you, I'm not doing enough back work, and um, I need to do more. So uh, definitely it'll be a two back workout a week. And um, as Julius Maddox said, you know, I, I can't incorporate my bench session and do a, t a ton of back work. And I like to be at the gym for no more than an hour and a half. So I'm not there anymore for five hours like I used to be when I was a younger man. So I like to get, get the majority of work done, get home and eat, you know. So I don't mind going to the gym seven days a week if I have to. That's what we're doing now. So there's nothing else to do. Or garage gym. Kennelly, your forearms are huge. What is the importance of forearms and how do you train them? Well, Ken Lane had big forearms, and Gus Rethwich, the president of the Wabdell Federation, set all big bench pressures from Tokarski and um, Arcidi. I mean, had forearms, and I believe they act as stabilizers. Um, every every muscle is important, you know. Every, link of a chain. You don't need to have two a thousand pound triceps and ten, and, and ten pound pecs. So you need to have a link of the chain, and each chain is strong as the other, and no weak links in that chain. So forearms, I, I train those. I I'm supposed to train them today, but. Uh, I was yeah, wasn't feeling to it today. That? Well, I did. I, I well, did I do forearms or try? yeah? I did a little bit of forearms. Yeah. I think you did an seven. But what you need to have is like a gripper. You know, when you're sitting on the couch um, watching uh, Tiger King or whatever you're watching, you know, have a. Uh, I, I used to have this. It's up in my other house. Yeah. It has springs on. it. I don't know what you call it, but it's a it's a gigantic green thing. I used to sit there and do twenty reps, twenty reps, and um, I mean, definitely helps uh, uh, reverse curls like this. But I do a lot of forearm work. It actually stemmed from an arm wrestling career I once had, which no one knows about. Uh, we'll talk about that in another episode, where I used to go and hustle pool, pool halls and bars with my uncle up in Spokane, Washington. And, uh, hey, I was 198, but uh, no one could beat me. I mean, I, I, it's a whole different story within itself. But we used to lay money down on pool tables, and drunk SOBs would come over thinking they could take this punk kid, and uh, they found different fleet. Different story, yeah, all by itself. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I sure that they did. That's the forum thing. Um, let's see here. Have you tried Rob's F8 shirt yet? I picked one up and came from SDP, and I love it. 
Rob. Rob for real? Is that Rob or F8? Does it say F8? Because that would... that, That's what I said, F8. F8. Isn't that a um, Titan <laughs> shirt? I don't know what F8. Uh, maybe you can specify. Is that a Titan? I think that might be a Titan shirt. F F no, F six was a Titan. You had to clue me in on that one. Uh, Sam, I need to know. Okay, so I'll watch for Rob. Pete, Rob, who? If he um, no. clarifies, um, did you ever compete with Bill Crawford from Metal Militia? Bill Crawford, yeah, two thousand three, Arnold. Uh, no, two thousand four. Uh oh. Not a, uh, not a, uh, not a great meet for me that year. I actually took. Uh, well, funny Crawford story was I beat Crawford. I did 828, he did 821, and I'm sitting in the uh, awards bank waiting for my third place trophy, and Kieran Kidder calls up Bill Crawford for third place. And I'm like, I did 828, he did 821. And I was like, you know, that kind of pissed me off because you had to take first through third at the Arnold to be invited the next year, or you had to go requalify. And I'm like sitting there, and I didn't say anything. A buddy of mine got up, went up there and corrected him, and Cra Crawford had to hand me his trophy. But the flip side of that is that at the, after that, we went in the back, and Bill Crawford, um, uh, a funny story about Bill Crawford, too, was, you know, some people said, oh, that guy can't even bench 405 raw. Well, I saw him in the warm-up do 405 for two reps like it was the bar. And I was like, well, F that story. You can't believe everything you hear. But he taught me the metal militia setup and told me how to put, you know, it, it was way different than what I was doing, you know, putting my feet further behind me, pushing my heels down. And um, that, you know, I didn't really continue with that. I was actually more apted to uh, follow uh, Matt Lamarck and Glenn Chabot putting their feet out in front. I couldn't adapt to that either, so I split the difference, took my old style and that far out style and combined them both, and that was what uh, the proof's in the pudding. So, what do you got? Um, are you still doing band and dumbbell tricep rollbacks? Haven't done those in a while. Uh, we attached the, the band to an easy curl bar underneath a bench, and I call them Hoff presses after Dave Hoff. Because I saw Dave Hoff doing a, a seminar somewhere, and he had that uh, set up, and he did 10 here, and he pushed 10 to the feet, and he brought 10 back here. So that's a variation I do. But putting the bands through the hands and into the dumbbells, haven't done those in a long time. Thank you for reminding me. I have to write that one down on the tricep training list of 49 exercises. Yeah, yeah. I want to skip to... Don't skip. I, I know, but I... <laughs> okay, um... Um, Read what, no, you talked about shirts earlier. What would be a good intro shirt for those that have only lifted raw? Ooh, good question. Well, I wouldn't say getting a triple ply shirt, you know, is it would be the ticket. I think a nice double ply, um, phenom. I'm a phenom guy, you know, so I'd recommend the phenom, and um, I would recommend getting one of those, uh, definitely. Um, I'm sure like Jimmy Cole would say, you know, Titan or. You know, there's other great shirts out there, and, and um, I don't know if you're looking for... I don't think they make polyester shirts anymore, like the old school, just yeah. just basic, plain... I mean, I don't think they make those anymore. I think you're you're, you're going to have to get this uh, more strict, restrictive material, like the Rage X material. Um, but I would definitely recommend a two-ply Phenom. It would be a nice uh, transition into the uh, shirted world. Yeah. Okay. Can you answer this one here? Yeah, John Smith, yeah. Ask me the question. <laughs> Okay, just be just read it like it is. Re don't, don't we can hold back. This is my what, TV show. You read, you read, you read what John Smith posted there. Um, what's your honest opinion on Tiny's record? Which record are we talking about? Ten seventy six. What do you think? Eleven hundred. I think it was. It was, uh, it was a great exhibition lift. I was under the assumption uh, that it was an uh, all time record, and it was in the books. And I went to powerliftingwatch.com. And I got uh, Michael Song's all-time, you know, world record list, and I looked at the shirt of benching, and he was credited with 1076. So I called the owner of Powerlifting Watch, and I got him on the phone. I can't remember what his name was. Sanchez something. I don't remember. And he told me, he's like, yeah, Tiny did that 1100, and he sanctioned it the next day, and we will count the record if he can supply us with other lifters that competed, Judges, rule books, and this is things of that nature, and then we will count his record. Well, this was mid-2014, and he did the record in December 13, and I guess nothing came to pass there. So, But he did it, you know, 1,100. I mean, it proved it could be done, which is phenomenal. And, um, you know, I uh, all I know is that uh, in the all-time, and Michael Song passed away, I believe, and rest in peace, but 
he was a statistician, and if you go to uh, find his records and go to the list, you'll see my name, Mendelssohn's name, and Meeker's name, and Meeker 76, me 75, and oh, I guess Mendelssohn's not on there anymore. Kolb, 1035 or whatever. Jeez. Right, yeah. Ching. Well, so there you go. I mean, you know, I, I just go by the all-time record book, what's in there, and that's what I, what's what I looked at. I didn't realize what that was until Gus Rethwich called me in May of 2002 and said, Ryan, you just tied Anthony Clark's record. And I said, you know, I got him on the phone. I'm like, well, Anthony Clark did 800. And he goes, no, that was an exhibition lift. You know, Her Herb Blossombrenner at the time only, so I, I had to go down and track this down. I was like, oh, my God, I just tied Anthony Clark. 785 was what he was credited with. So um, say, say what you want. I mean, I, I just I just call it like I see it. I look at the all-time record list, and that's what I go by. So I don't think uh, calling it bullshit, I think – the guy did it. I mean, I, I watch it every once in a while. 1,100 freaking pounds, man. I mean, it's impressive. And uh, he did it, you know. And um, I wish we were still in our youthful age and it was five, six years ago because I know he could do it again and again. I mean, he's, Meeker's a strong son of a bitch. <laughs> I'm saying it, man. And, uh, yeah, he, he can do anything he wants to. And he, he mastered the shirt. And him and I are going to – I think he wants to be our first guest on this show. That's what we're hoping for, yeah. yeah. We're trying to figure out the Skype thing so that we yeah. can do it from – he's in Texas, I think. Unless I, unless what I said is offensive and he doesn't want to be on here anymore, I don't know. <laughs> I'm just still be on our show. Yeah, awesome lifter, man. I, I think you're great. Yeah. No next question. Um. So it was what? No. What do you think of high rep work with a ram or a slingshot? Never done it. Never done it. Usually when I put on a, I, I don't, I don't think it would hurt. I mean, um, what's high? Ten reps, fifteen reps. I mean, hey, all training works. So I mean, that, and that's a variation to throw in your training. I don't. Myself, I've never done it yet, but now that I've heard about it, I'm, maybe we'll do some high reps in the uh, in the slingshot. Um, I definitely uh, I, I wouldn't put it down. Um, just never done it. When I put on a slingshot, I'm looking to go as heavy as I can because max effort day we max out. So I don't know how. Maybe on the downslide we can put on the uh, a, a lower end slingshot and do some repetition work. Wouldn't hurt at all. <laughs> Do you incorporate pull-ups and dips in your workout? If so, how do you put this exercise? How do you put these exercises and how many sets slash reps? Pull-ups. I haven't done a pull-up since what? 2011. I've never seen you do a pull-up. I did three pull-ups. When time. did you? In 2011. Hazenberg's old gym. Did you? Yeah, mm -hmm. I did a few pull-ups. Uh, don't do. I don't do pull-ups. Dips though. I love pull-ups and dips. I know that. Um, uh, Jeremy Hornstrad does a lot of dips and weighted dips, and we we incorporate those, rate those after uh, benching. Obviously, sometimes a chain around our neck. We did them the other day with a uh, with a band around the upper part of our back through our hands, and uh, there was a faster eccentric phase, and, and that met, led to a faster concentric phase. So, but we're definitely going to start overloading those when we get back to the gym and have the proper proper apparatuses to do so. But definitely. Uh, if, you, if you were to ask me when to do them, I mean, pull-ups, like I said, don't do them. Uh, but as far as dips, a couple weeks in a row, and we switch. To, it's an assistance movement, so we'd, switch, we'd do a couple weeks in a row and switch. Usually volume. So um, So going back to the um, Sam's question about yeah. the shirt, he says, sorry about that. Yes, Rob Farrell's shirt. Rob Farrell's shirt, what, what do I think? I don't know. Uh, I wore it at the garage gym the other day. went seven, no, 8.55 to a three-board. Uh, let the other guys in my crew wear it, and because um, I thought it needed some breaking in, so we, uh, a few other guys kind of wore it, and um, I'm, I'm not saying we broke it in per se, but uh, when I put it on, it took um, it took 855 to get to three boards. So and I looked at the boards, and I think you know I used to think that you know take another 50, 100 pounds to get all the way down. So uh, definitely liked it. I mean, popped right up. Um, um, I'm not 100% uh, right now with um, heavy training. Um, it's been hit and miss, and with this COVID crap going on, it's been hard to get to the gym sometimes and do these things, but you do the best with what you got. And once we get gyms back open and life back to semi-normal, you'll see videos, and I'll, I'll have a bunch of new uh, apparatuses to showcase. Yeah. But so far, that's the, that's the only shirt that I have that's a – uh, I don't have the bench daddy. I don't have the Viper yet. So those are coming. J.M. Blakely had, had the tricep extension exercise he did that made a lot. Oh, sorry. That's not a question. I was trying to read. 
skip the comments. Um, well, don't skip any because I mean, well, no, no. Do you want me to read the comments? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You Go want ahead. me to skip the comments, right? Just keep reading. Yeah, no, I know that was a comment, not a yeah. question. Right. Um, do you regret not trying a 700 Rob Engine competition? You got close. You hit I'd say, well, when, when I used... yourself on 675 on Yeah, one. when I go, when I was going to do a raw contest, I would train it for like four weeks. I never put a hundred ten percent because of the shirt. You know, I'm a shirt guy, so I wear shirts. But uh, there was one time in 2004, I did a seven, no, uh, I did 1074 that day in that meet. It was an 8, 8 PA meet, I believe, Scott Taylor. And I was, uh, the Forza bench was on stage. It was my Forza, and, you know, you could warm up another thing. I wanted to warm up on that bench. So in between uh, uh, flights, you know, I was out there warming up. And it takes me a while to warm up. You know, I got to get up to, I think I opened with nine, five, no, I think I opened with a 1,000 that day. I did, 1,000. So I warmed up. You want to go up to, to 905 at least and go to a one board. And I was rushed, and I was big as big as a house that day. All, every bit of 360. Just There's a picture, too, on my Facebook page where this lady's interviewing me. She's holding a microphone up like I'm some kind of giant. And, I, and my eyes are about half shut because I'm so bloated of uh, food and, and eh, whatever. I had a time and place. But that day, I should have, would have, could have, you know. Uh, but you know, I was uh, under contract with Enzer. And you don't lift raw when you're under contract with Enzer. And he had the best shirt back then and i wasn't about to jeopardize that but i remember warming up and there's a video about where i go 745 off a two or three board which i normally shirt up but i was, I was being rushed so i remember I, I punched that up and i turned around and looked at paul and i was like paul i got that raw record today and it was 701 at the time or 710 or i don't know what it was but i looked at him and that was the day i should have shot for it because it was every bit oh man strong but uh haven't would i regret not going for it uh, it would be nice to have it you know um but it takes time. It's not, you know, it's not something that's just going to fall into my hands and I'm going to be able to do. I have to train it. And I just didn't want to commit to the time to do that. Um, I always prided my raw bench, you know, being between, between 620 and 675 touch and go in the gym. And, you know, I, I kept it there. I mean, I did a 650 in a, in a meet one time and missed a 675. But, um, God, now the, the raw bench is so far out there, 770. Never thought in my day I would see a man do that. And when he does 800... It's going to be a glorious thing to see in this lifetime. It's so cool. Like, wow. Yeah, it perplexes me. What are your thoughts on the importance of training pecs? Do you think they get enough work via speed max or dumbbell work, or should they be isolated? If so, how much volume? I do both. Um, Louis will say that they're, they're basically stabilizers, um, but I, like I said, I don't want a thousand pound triceps and, and ten pound pecs. So um, they, a lot, a lot of my ninety percent of my work in the gym is close grip, you know, pinky on the ring or closer in. So they don't get a lot of uh, stimulus that way. Um, dumbbells, yes, they do, but um, I'm not gonna lie to anybody. I, I, I like to do pec deck. I like to do cable crossovers, and I. I like to do them because you don't want to have an overdeveloped shoulder rear delt front delt and ha delt and have these flat pectorials. So you got to have a you want to be able to set a glass of wine on these pecs. So they're work in progress right now. But when I was doing in the old school days, we used to bench raw. Two weeks out, you throw in your shirt. So there was a lot of raw movements, and I had a well developed chest at that time. And then the, then it went into well, you train in your shirt all the time. And by doing that, it really took away from the muscle building properties of lifting raw. And, um, uh, but I still, nobody knows this, but I still train like a bodybuilder, you know. I try to put muscle where it's needed, and I want it everywhere. I don't, like I said, I don't want over or underdeveloped areas. I want, I want it all um, symmetrical. So. What meat was it where you raised up after an attempt where the blood exploded all out of your nose and all over your face? Well, it didn't come out of my nose. It came out of my tear ducts, too. Uh, that, yeah, Mendelssohn uh, Expo 2000, oh, where did I bleed there? Five? Uh, it was a 946 bench, and I had threw on a different shirt, and it didn't touch. It was so tight. You know, the compression in these shirts is unreal, especially in the Rage X. The material doesn't have that much flex or memory or uh, elasticity to it, so if it's not set perfectly, it's going to come down and bind up, in which it did. And when a shirt binds up, what it's trying to do is push your, your core, your body down like this and make you want to bow up to it. And you want to do the absolute opposite of that. You want to pull your head back and keep your chest up and not fade into the shirt and, and roll down with it because that's not what you want to do. But, uh, yeah, basically the nose would start to bleed. And I have this, and there's a medical reason for it, but the tear ducts 
when that happened, that blood shot out four inches up in the air and then pooled in the in the eye wells. And uh, I was more pissed that I didn't get the lift, but um, uh, I got off the got off there and uh, shook it off like a dog and walked away. And then uh, Big Vicker got a nice picture of it with the tongue out, the bloody picture. I mean, this is what it is, man. I mean, there's going to be blood if you're not pushing hard enough to create bloody noses and burst at eye blood vessels in your eye, then you're not pushing hard enough. If you're not taking out weight and seeing the, your vision blur, you're not going heavy enough. So, you know, you got, you got to push it. I mean, this is powerlifting. This, this is all about numbers. This isn't about, oh, I can do 40 reps with 315. That's great. You know, but this is maximal, you know, strength there we're talking about. And it's, it's, that's what it's all about, pushing it to the limits. How often do you train in your shirt? Oh, once a month. Um, usually there's two, two max effort, uh, uh, exercises, whether it be a band or board or floor press, and then usually bring the shirt. The only problem with that is there's only two of us in our crew that wear shirts. So hypothetically, I want to put on my shirt when he puts on a shirt. So we have to coexist on what day we're going to do that. And, uh, but right now it's once a month. If I was gearing up for a meet and I'm going to go back to my old methods and that's in the shirt, um, every workout. And I'll probably go back to my old old ways that, that uh, where I would train two weeks over a thousand pounds on a board or something. And I, I had a method in the third week I fall flat on my face because you do the same movement for three weeks in a row. So the third week I would deload and I know that's not the way you do it, but that's how I did it back then. I push it to the extreme for two weeks and then, uh, but always in the shirt, always training heavy weight. You got to acclimate to holding heavy weights. You can't just like, Oh, I'm going to do slingshot and do seven and eight. And then I'm going to get ready for a meet and, and I'm going to go 1100. No, you got to train with that weight and training 10, 1050, 1100, 1200, and get used to holding and handling it. Uh, time under tension. There's a whole bunch of, of things that go into that. So, um, the question basically, I'm going to be in it, uh, two, two, three times a month, probably pretty soon. What do you think about Thor breaking the deadlift record by himself? You broke records while waiting for other lifters attempts. I feel this is a publicity stunt that will hurt the sport long term. Thor. He wants to know what you think about how um, Thor's going to, uh, they're going to, uh, that like he's going to have an att attempt to break um, Eddie Hall's record. Yeah. But, but since you can't do any meets right now, it's going to be just him. That's fine. And they're going to video it. That's fine. Oh, well, you, yeah, you. So they're gonna, they're gonna do a lot like, of controversy oh, about whether so they're fair or not. Okay, so basically he's gonna do it. Everybody else has to do it at a meet. Yeah. So he's gonna do it in a garage, and they're gonna count this as a record. I don't, I mean, I don't know. If I don't know. Uh, he he's is. Uh, him, I don't know. Yeah, he. Um, I believe he'll whatever he'll do, he'll do it again. I don't. I don't. He has more credibility than that to uh, to do something and, and video it and say this is a record. And my understanding is in the strongman world, there were straps and they do this and that. I'm not I'm taking away nothing away from him, you know. And he will pull over uh, 1,100 pounds and. Uh, I think he's just going to show off and do it for fun, and then he's going to go out to Australia or wherever you go, and Arnold Schwarzenegger will be there like he was for Eddie Hall, and he'll do it. And that's a big man, so there's no question. He's not going to do it once and never do it again like some people. Um, but uh, I think he'll repeat himself, and I, don't think, I, I think it'll be a good thing. Just give it time. We're going way past our time, but I'll I know, get to I'm some like, questions here. Read faster. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think of the bamboo earthquake bar? How would slash do you use it? I don't have one myself. Um, we use it at the end of a workout. Usually it's a great uh, therapeutical device when we hang kettlebells from it to do it uh, uh, for pressing movements afterwards. Or sometimes we do, we hook bands to it and kettlebells to it and we do extensions too. So. I was at Westside, and they had a bamboo bar that had a, a camber in it. I mean, they had a lot of interesting toys there. I had to walk around like a kid in a candy store. And I picked it up, and I was like, whoa, what is this? Yeah, cambered bar, bamboo bar. It was, it was the most impressive thing I've seen. I don't have one, um, but at the gym we have one, and we usually use it at the end of a workout. I definitely would like to do 300 pounds of kettlebells on it and see what that does. I haven't done that yet. I've seen Dave Hoff do it, so that definitely is something I want to try. But we usually use it once a month, to be honest. Do you think you and Mendelssohn will meet up again? You know you've got him, bro. <sighs> Mendelssohn, I hope so. We're, getting, we're not getting any younger, you know, and, and I think it would be fun to go out there and, and, uh, and, and just root each other on and talk shit to each other like the old school days and 
May the best man win. My understanding is Mendelssohn's actually got in touch with John Ellick and is getting one of his shirts too. And I, I'm just going to throw it out there. I think if Mendelssohn gets one of these, I, I've seen him in the this red shirt he's been wearing, and he's been doing good in that. But I, I really think he'll benefit from these uh, different shirts now. And um, I hope he gets one, and I hope he trains in it. And just throwing this out there, not saying it will ever happen, but maybe next year, you know, if the uh, Arnold and XBC have it out there, we – Maybe get to go out there in the main stage and, and, and showcase uh, some crazy benches. Get Hoff and Meeker and myself and Kolb and shit. Go at it. Who knows? We'll see. Do you think your t- time off from lifting will hurt your strength? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, Any time off, anytime you walk away from the gym... You know, and I don't walk away from the gym. With hands, like, right now. Like, yeah, absolutely. Oh, it's horrible. Yeah, I mean, I'm not handling heavy weights. I'm not training with uh, my crew. So I definitely, I'm going to have a little mountain to climb when I come back. And I, like I tell people around here, you know, it's like when we come back, don't, I mean, guys want to know, what do I do when I get when the gyms come back? Well, you need to slowly work back into where you were. If you, if you go too fast, you haven't been training that often. Some people aren't even training at all. And they're just going to hop right in and think, oh, I did 405 when I left a month and a half ago. They're going to end up blowing a pack or something. So you need to come back and have that transition period, just like this COVID-19 thing. We're having a transition period where they're going to allow certain things slowly open the dial. So you should do that in your training too. But my my strength has suffered greatly in the past month. And it feels like it's been four months, but it's only been a month. But it's, uh, it's suffered, I'll tell you that. I mean, I haven't had – at the garage gym we train at, the most weight you can get on the bar is 855. You know, so there's just uh, – we're just holding out. Hopefully May 4th our gym's supposed to open at midnight. That's what it says on Instagram. Okay. That's the message I got. So hopefully that happens. Okay, the most important question. Pancakes or waffles? Waffles? I, I've eaten enough pancakes uh, back in the day. We got a waffle maker. We get those uh, Kodiak cakes. Make them into waffles? Yeah, put a little, crunch up some almonds in there and some chocolate chips. Oh. We don't have that long time. No, we haven't. We got them out there. That's a good idea. Yeah, they're good. Uh, if I'm... Cody Plum wants to know, yeah. if I'm 280 now, how do I eat to get to the 330 that you predicted for me in February? Cody Plum, first of all, I want your physique. I saw you at the last uh, the Bench Gods meet, and you, you look like a, a, a clone of Mendelssohn, like you were chiseled out of granite. And, I, I mean, I've seen we, – we, you and I had a picture before. It was posted on somewhere, and you weren't that big. This time you were you were blown, and I was like – I. I want to pick your brain on what you do for a physique like that because you're, you're ch- chiseled out of steel. But um, as far as uh, you, want to, you want to get big, you got to eat. And um, I don't know what you're eating now. Most people eat like four solid meals or five. What I tell people is uh, slowly introduce a high-calorie shake in between one of those solid meals. So breakfast is solid, uh, high-calorie shake next. Um, lunch is solid, high-calorie shake the next. But maybe just incorporate one or two and slowly work up to getting, you know, 10 – 10,000 calories. I don't think you need to go to 15, maybe 12. It depends on uh, on uh, your ability to grow and put on size. And the training goes hand in hand with that also. I mean, you can't just eat all this and then, and, and, but you know how to train. So definitely more calories, man. I mean, if you want to put on size, you got to eat. And sometimes you'll be eating and swallowing and it might be throwing it back up. I've had very many instances of that of eating. I had, a, I had a watch that would go off every hour and 15 minutes. It would ding. I would get up and go to the kitchen and, and chug an RTD. I mean, it, it's just yeah, pretty soon you just, you know, you're having six bowel movements a day when you're getting 15,000 calories. That's just the bottom line. So you, you know, there's money in, money out, you know, so food in, food out. Do you feel a buffalo bar, basically a bar with a curve in the middle, is beneficial or pause bench is better option? So which one do you think is better? Oh, both. Duffalo bar oh, Duffalo Bar, definitely. I mean, uh, um, Chris Duffin has some Scientology behind his bar, how it seats the shoulder socket, this, that, and the other. But the fact that it's got a two-and-a-half-inch camber, oh, definitely. A lot of people don't like to use it because um, it's not a ego bar. You're not going to walk into a gym and show off with the Duffalo Bar. I mean, that thing is uh, – that puts you in some, uh, some real deficit when you bring it down. And a lot of people aren't flexible – like myself, when I first got it, it was, you know, I was too tight to get down below there. But now, it um, I, it's very beneficial. And then, what's fun is you do a, you do your max effort work in that, and then right after that, throw on a straight bar and bring it down. It's like bringing it to a two board now. I mean, you, I think you got to incorporate it in training. I actually have a Duffalo prototype bar 
which is a little less curvature to it, probably an inch and a half curve in it, and it was one of the practice ones he made. And uh, so I have both, um, but one, one's pretty extreme. We, we do speed work with it, actually. And uh, we put fat grips on it, and uh, and uh, we use the duffel bar for two weeks in a row. We use a football bar for two weeks in a row, and uh, we rotate them in like that. But definitely um, both use the duffel bar, and usually a, a five rep max is what we like to do with the duffel bar, and then um, then throw on a straight bar for that and bring it down to your chest, and you'll be like, damn, this is nothing. What do you got? Don't keep me waiting now. <laughs> Who was your best training partner? BJ Dirk. Uh, Moses Lake, Washington. I moved there 2002 and established myself there. He came on the scene in a double poly, every bit of uh, probably 220 pounds he weighed, and he did a 350 bench that day. Got entangled with me, and two years later, he was at the Mendelssohn Classic given uh, J Jason Jackson a run for his money in the lightweight tournament there. Uh, almost took first place. Uh, he had a 7-11. I think Jason Jackson was, went 7-16 uh, or something. BJ, he put another shirt on, couldn't touch in it, and, and he tried 7-33. But uh, always showed up to work and brought intensity. He was a mini Vogelpool. Like, yeah, he would show up and um, he would start wow, fights. That's in, a compliment. Yeah, I mean, he, I've seen him uh, headbutting people in the gym and literally starting fights. We would uh, have a gym up there where we locked the door at 3 o'clock and close the gym and crank up the music so loud because I didn't want any talking. I wanted the music so loud that nobody could talk. So we would have to do uh, numbers like three, four plates on there. Yeah, yeah. That's how we did it. And uh, he he brought it. And uh, he was my handoff guy for a while. Took him to the, the senior nationals out there in 2005. Um, and uh, by doing so, he learned from Matt Lamarck and, and um, uh, uh, Albert, George Albert. You know, and they, they, they taught him how to base his feet out, and he came back with that, that and uh, really excelled at it. Went up to, uh, took my record on the Wabdell Federation, too, at 242. Bastard. Yeah, had a 585 at 242, I was proud of. He did a 640. Oh, there you go. Records are made to be broken. So don't get too too comfy and say I'm a, a record holder. And it's, uh, they're going to be taken, and that's the beauty part of it. That people are always excelling, so be jitter. And there's like some nice comments about how people are enjoying the Q&A. Oh, cool. Um, who's older, you or Mendelssohn? Mendelssohn. I think Mendelssohn's 39 and I'm 33. <laughs> I was like, I'm like, oh, then he's definitely younger than you. He's just a little, he's a few, maybe 38. Okay. I think Mendelssohn's 38, I'm 33. He's like five years ahead of me. So, next question. Okay, great. Thanks for liking my recent picture. Uh, when are you and Ashley getting married? Um, hmm. well, I think we already are, like, common law wife. I think after 10 years, yeah, I think, they say common law. I don't know. I don't know the laws. Been together, like, 12? Something like that. Yeah, it's crazy. Um, pretty much, I don't know. <laughs> Ashley, will you marry me? <laughs> Who knows? That may happen on the Bitch Monster TV show. You never know. You never know what's going to happen on here. Just never know. No. no. And that was the last question. Oh, no, we had another one coming in. I was going to say that we're going to end on Christian. this question. Uh, shoulder prehab work that you would recommend? Well, I don't uh, do prehab work. You should. I probably should. Um, I, you know, but me, I like to think I'm bulletproof. And when you're young, you you, you actually can do things, and, and, and bullets will ricochet off you. Now that uh, age is setting in, um, I probably need to do some more of that. Uh, you know, more rotator cuff work, side delt raises, uh, all, a whole conglomerate of uh, protecting these things because... I had a, uh, did try to do a raw meet when, three years ago? Tried to open with 611. Would have got it. Was it that long ago? Yeah, I don't know. I went out there and I, I got an AC, AC separation uh, sprain, a grade one, grade A, something like that. So they did x ray. So I had that, uh, uh, took the bar out, took it a little high, brought it down, and uh, it kind of let go there. So um, had to nurse that back to health. So definitely don't, the shoulders take a beating, you know, just like in squatting, hips. Take a beating, and, and you see many people later in life needing hip replacements and shoulder replacements. So, uh, I, th I think you need to know when to gas it and when not to gas it, and and, and train accordingly. But uh, uh, not listening to your body is a big one. And when you go in the gym and you're pushing hard, maybe the brain says, "Oh, I'm, I'm going to be hardcore. I'm going to go, go, go." But the body says differently, and it will tell you differently. And like I said before, injury prevention technique. I used piss poor technique on that, that that bench that one day, and it, it got me. And, uh, but uh, definitely need to do more rotation. I used to have a shoulder horn. I used to have one of those, uh, definitely would, would use that often. I don't know where it is. 
but uh, yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely, definitely some shoulder prehab would be a good thing. thing. Thank you for mentioning that, by the way, because with this downtime right now, definitely would be a good time to do it. I mean, we're we're training seven days a week because there's nothing else to do in life. Can't fish, can't do anything else here. Go to these private gyms and uh, and do uh, calisthenics and whatnot. So not. But hopefully we'll get back to normal here, and um, I'll get back to the old uh, ways of my training. And um, But definitely need some more of that shoulder prehab. I like that word, word prehab. Something I don't do. What are those scars on your shoulder? Where? Somebody that's obviously seen you without... Scar? I don't have a scar on my shoulder. I have a birthmark over here. Yeah, it's a, it's a red um, port wine... Strawberry colored birthmark. Um, it's an interesting conversation piece because I'll wear a tank top around town and I'm a big guy. So when you walk up to people, they don't take any appreciation to the muscles. They look directly at this birthmark. And so I, I start off by saying that it was from a bad heroin injection. That's how you start a conversation about that. I mean, if people don't know what that is, I mean, it is what, I mean, it's a birthmark. So I was going to get it lasered off, and, uh, but no, it's a part of me and it's me. So. I like, I like to think, think it's a scar, scar but unfortunately, it's uh, it's there for life. What are you attempting to hit next year at this time? God, well, you know, tell you with these uh, new shirts that are coming in the mail, um, it, it remains to be seen. I've been told a lot of things in this year when I talk to people, and I've seen a lot of things. I'm not going to sit here and say, well, because he can do. I saw a guy do 850 at 220 in the bench daddy at the uh, Arnold. I was impressed. At 220, the CNA 850 bench. Shit. So, I mean, um, sit back, relax. Uh, let me let me get the toys first and play with them, and we'll see what, what comes. Uh, I don't want to spit on a number because I'll jinx myself. It's basically going to be what it is, what it is, but I hope it's uh, I hope it's a world record. You know, that's what I'm shooting for. I'm not going to like, oh, I just want to. I told Louis Simmons a year, a year ago on the phone in April. I told him at this time there was no uh, – uh, bench daddy or whatever. So I basically told Louie on the phone and I retracted that statement at breakfast with him. I told Louie, he's like, Louie, I don't care if I bench 1,100. I just want to be able to go out there and do 1,000 pounds like 135 like I used to. Well, that statement was retracted because I told Louie at breakfast and we talked about the bench daddy shirt and that conversation we had was very um, well received. And I think that... Uh, let me see what I can do. I mean, I there's no learning curve for me. I mean, I, you, I can pick up something and figure out how to use it in five minutes. So I definitely need to get it, use it, start acclimating the central nervous system to these weights again, making sure I have three people that can hand off the weight. I mean, it's not just a back guy anymore. I mean, they don't have Paul Roch here. And, uh, and uh, so I need three people. And you know as well as I do, on a three-man handoff, when one guy's off over here, I mean, Mendelssohn tore his peck because of that, you know? I mean, it, the handoffs have to be perfect. So I have a set amount of people that do that. And so those things need to be in, in line, and then we uh, and then we start posting videos, and you'll see the numbers that I'm throwing up, and you can calculate those and figure that out pretty quick. Those rolling dumbbells, those rolling dumbbell tricep extensions. What and how do they work? Well, basically, you're you're you're, you're strengthening the, the connective tissue that runs over here, the ligaments and tendons, and the triceps, obviously, but it puts a tremendous amount of strain right here. And so basically you grab the dumbbells and you don't hold uh, the dumbbell with your pinky against the, the dumbbell. You actually hold it right in the middle. So you have to squeeze the, the dumbbells. You don't want to let it sit in there where it's sitting on your hand where you don't have to squeeze the dumbbell. Squeezing the, the, the dumbbell activates the triceps. And then you roll them back and usually try to keep your elbows in here and then push them back up again. And uh, they work phenomenally. And uh, I can't say enough about them. But um, I'll post a video on how to do those once – we're able to do so because there's, there's some technicality issues that you may run into and that you don't want to irritate this this part of your um, tricep extensor back there because it, it can get inflamed and it, it, uh, you won't like them anymore. You'll hate them you'll never do them again. So they need to be done correctly. Not an eagle lift either. If you try to put too much weight on there and you're jacking them up like this, you're just going to piss this off and, and you'll tap out on them and never want to do them. Do you, feel as, do you feel as strong as you did like back when you – Hit the 1075. Oh, um, um, nah, no, because I had a lot of body weight behind that. You know, I was 350 plus pounds. So, you know, and I trained heavy and I trained often and I had a good crew. I had a great shirt. 
And, um, but, you, you know, know, times are changing, changing and, and like I said, I'm not going to be 350. I'm not going to be much over 310. So, uh, so th- things, things are changing, so I have to rely more on technique now. I don't have that, that uh, abdomen I once had. You know, I had a pretty good boiler on me, and that really limited the amount of travel I had to push that bar. So um, it's all up here. You know, I mean, I can sit here and say, oh, I'm lighter now. So I'm, everything is heavier. It's not easier. That's why I put on, you know, that amount of weight. That's why I got as big as I could. Because weight moves weight. I mean, I'm, I'm not one that's going to sit back and, like, cut to 242 and then try, like, 800 and say, oh, I'm four times body weight. No. I'm not going to do that. I'm, gonna, I'm just going to go out there and do what I can do because that's what I do. And. Whatever happens, happens. Do you train lower body like a bodybuilder and upper like west side? Yep. Yeah, I, I, I used to put on a, a squat briefs, and they're slowly getting acclimated to my training again. I actually had briefs on the other day. Don't say what I was squatting. I have pictures. No, it, no I did have a, <laughs> of in your power Yeah, power. so you know, uh, train it like a bodybuilder. You know, I like to have, you got to have strong legs. You know, like I told the story. You know, uh, you know, I could bench 315 at one time for 10, squat it for one. You know, and my bench wasn't going nowhere. So you got to train legs. Uh, people may disagree with me on that, but, uh, you know, I, I think that uh, I like to get 500 pounds on my back again. That was used to be the minimum. You know, 500 pounds, eight, uh, three, three sets of eight, five sets of eight, you know, knee wraps, and uh, did it raw. But, um, you know, you got to have, uh, have, have leg drive. And I love to squat, too. I mean, I think it builds the uh, lung capacity. <gasps> I mean, uh, you know, brace under that type of weight. Don't do any deadlifts that heavy, though. Mm-mm. Uh-uh. Not yet. Who knows? Not yet. You will. Did you, did you train with metal militia? No. But if I ever get on a plane and we're COVID-free and I end up in New York, upstate, somewhere out there, I would definitely, definitely go out there. I don't think I can hang with Little Crawford in the Crown Royal, though. That's not my game. So I would have to uh, have a Shirley Temple. Have you ever been to Mendelssohn's gym? It's on the well. You know, we were supposed to go down to Kern in in uh, San Diego this week. Yeah. Yeah. Somebody I know was going to go down there and lift in the three lift meet down there, and I was going to jet up to Mendelssohn's gym and make a surprise appearance and grapple with him in his uh, jujitsu area there because. I'd have walked in, and we'd have filmed it. It'd been fun. We'd have been rolling on the ground like a bunch of uh, gorillas. So, but I will be there. It's just a matter of time. I mean, got to get out of Washington one time sooner or later. So, definitely want to go down and uh, and visit him and have him yell at me again. That'd be fun. Yeah. And that was our last. Okay. Well, God, we're, we're way past. Uh, we, uh, we were going to keep these at 30 minutes long, and um, I don't know. We're way past the mark now. Could you do a video? Well, we can. Yeah, we can do a video. Could you do a video for X to be a correct handoff when this is when this BS is over with? Like yes, we will. A correct three-man handoff. Yes. Yeah. Just so like let everybody know that both, I like a single. Like how the best way to do a single. Talk about the details, and then the sure. best way to do a, a three-man. That's right. Yes, like, we will. Like let everybody know that I finished Tiger King. Great, great documentary. That yeah, was good. Yeah, interesting characters in that. that um, all I got to say is I don't think the punishment fit the crime, but that's my opinion, and this is my show. So, um, say la vie. There's one more question. Yeah. Do you want to go back to it? Go. Okay, right, right. Yeah, real last quick. question, yeah. and then we'll save anything else that comes in for next time. But we'll sneak one more in here. Um, where was that gym in the road to Arnold that had all the Forza equipment in it? That was Giorgio's uh, gym up in Spokane, Washington, when he, Giorgio Sr. or Jr. owned it. And, you know, Giorgio was the manufacturer for Forza Strength Equipment, which was in Spokane also. So we went up there and shot that. And you guys heard that story, of course. I wasn't really wanting to do that video that day, and they said I had to do it. So what do you do? You do it. But, um, no, he had a power area in the back there with all fours of equipment. And um, that was a cool thing. That gym no longer exists, like a lot of them do. And um, that was, uh, God, what was the name? It was, I don't think it was called Giorgio's Gym. I don't want to, God, it was, that was two, 2004, man. Um, but awesome gym. Had, had a good time in there. Uh, you know, I wish I could have waited another week. Because uh, I'd done 405 for about 29 reps, probably with a little rest. But I just benched 800, you know, six days before. And I was I'm never really good a week after a contest, to be honest with you. Um, I, but, you know, a couple cheeseburgers at McDonald's and a Diet Coke and an hour drive. Huh? Yeah. <laughs> then, yeah, I did it. What the hell? Yeah. But, hey, boom, bada, bing. Thank you, everybody. Yeah, I mean, thank you, thank you got so this chat much. thing working. Awesome. Yeah.
Great yeah, this is a little longer and... than we nice like to keep you guys, but uh, don't ask me questions, man, because I won't shut up. <laughs> That's the problem here. Yeah. And um, but I think next week, uh, I think we're planning for Thursday, maybe again. We're gonna cover the Arnold, and we'll uh, talk about our experiences out there real quick, and um, we'll do more questions, of do course. More questions, probably get that at the end of each one. Yeah, because I don't want to. I don't even be hanging here. No. I'll, I'll answer any question, man. Just throw it out here, and I'll, I'll not BS and beat around the bush. I'll tell you like it is. And hey, that's just me, man. I mean, love me, hate me, love by few, hated by many, whatever it may be. 